So now I'm going to introduce Madhvi. She really doesn't need an introduction, uh, but I'm going to do it anyway. And that's why I'm keeping it very short. So Madhvi Gurada Divan is an additional solicitor general in the Supreme Court of India and a designated senior advocate at the Supreme Court. She commenced her practice in the Bombay High Court in 1994. And the rest, as they say, is history. So welcome, Madhvi. It's great having you here. Well, thank you for inviting me. And I think this is a very impressive uh, forum to be on because, uh, well, I certainly didn't have uh, access to fora like this when I was starting out and I wish I did. Maybe I would have been smarter at the, uh, you know, in the manner in which uh, I planned my career. I'm so glad that you got This conversation is going to be immensely beneficial for a lot of women who aspire to have a career path like you and even the ones who don't because I think they can learn from your experience. So, so thank you so much for taking the time out of, I know what is a very hectic schedule and also your holiday schedule. So thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Um, so for everyone, Madhvi doesn't really need an introduction, but because I have to, and because I'm tasked with doing this, I'm going to give her one anyway. It's very short because like I said, she really doesn't need it. But Madhvi Gurarya Divan is an additional solicitor general in the Supreme Court of India and a designated senior advocate at the Supreme Court. She commenced her practice in the Bombay High Court in 1994, and the rest, as they say, is history. Um, and so with that, the introduction is now out of the way. Uh, if you are ready, can I dive straight into the questions that I think I'm dying to ask you? Sure, sure. Go right ahead. Okay, so I'm sure you've been asked about this topic plenty of times. However, time and again, it stays relevant and goes to the root of representation of women in litigation, a number which is still sort of staggeringly low. Litigating women often feel that they're faced with a choice between family, motherhood, and so on versus their career. Reasons could be taking time off work, pregnancy, the arduous journey of coming back to practice, what happens to their briefs in the meanwhile, optics, perception, etc. As someone who, you know, at this moment seemingly has it all, what are your thoughts? Do you think the sentiment is true? Is this actually something that affects a woman's litigating career trajectory? And how did you navigate this decision? Okay, um, well, first of all, I'd li like to say that um, I don't think it's true that there aren't enough women in litigation. There are lots of women in litigation. Uh, the challenge is that they don't last out. Many of them don't last out. They fall off the ladder at some point. And most often it is because they are unable to uh, juggle their families and uh, their career simultaneously. So this is a huge, huge struggle. Um, and I think it's a struggle essentially because, I mean, the obvious is that uh, your biological clock is ticking uh, and it collides with the most uh, productive and formative and perhaps the determinative years in your career. Those years are also uh, perhaps the, the, the ideal years for child bearing and child raising for a woman. So, you know, you have a you know, head on collision over there. And, um, you know, frankly, it's because perhaps, uh, and, and, and this is perhaps true of any mainstream profession. So whether you have a corporate job or you have, you know, if you're working in a law firm, um, you know, these are challenges that women face everywhere. I think litigation, not just litigation, I'd say counsel practice, it's, it's a little different, uh, perhaps more difficult. Uh, in most ways, and in, in some ways, um, I'll explain why uh, um, uh, it gives space to women, because I think um, the, the difficulty with a career in litigation, in, in counsel practice, as you know it in the Bombay High Court, is that it is not a job, right? Um, it, is a, um, it is a profession, and, um, you know, it's... Um, it, it's something that requires, you, it, it really rides on your own goodwill and the perception of your ability to deliver. And that I think um, uh, women generally tend to be discounted, unfortunately, even without families and babies to, to, to look after. But uh, uh, because, uh, you know, ultimately um, it's, it's men who have set the rules, men who have structured the profession, and, uh, um, and a very vast majority of, uh, you know, in the judiciary is, of course, uh, you know, the judiciary is also populated mainly by men. So I think for all of those reasons, you're already up against a little bit of a challenge. 
Um, also with, with counsel practice, I mean, and this, I mean, I've spoken about this um, before. Uh, when I uh, uh, started out, I think within about three years, I was already a mom. And, uh, you know, I just started out, I, 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 I didn't plan my career very well. I didn't come from a family of lawyers. And so it was, it was really a challenge navigating it even without a family, frankly. And then when uh, my daughter came along uh, and I thought I was very efficient in terms of, you know, I got back pretty quickly, um, but you know, the briefs had been redistributed naturally, naturally. And I, I can tell you that I never ever forgot those very few solicitors who actually came back to me with the brief. Uh, which may have, you know, in the meantime, gone to another of my male colleagues at the bar. Um, so I'm really in, indebted to those very few solicitors who had faith in me. But the general perception, as you know, is that your oh, women will sort of, oh, you know, she's got a family now, she's got a child now, she's she's well taken care of. This was also, you know, if you have, you have a spouse who is reasonably well established, in many ways, it kind of, you know, it, certainly it pays your bills and you don't have to worry about where, you know, uh, um, uh, you're going to sustain yourself, which is a huge advantage, mind you. But at the same time, it also creates that perception that, oh, she doesn't need it. Her male colleagues need the work more than she does. So all of these little things do contribute to, um, you know, sort of, well, kind of deterring you perhaps. And, uh, you know, the dilemmas, of course, which are uh, worrying in your mind at that stage. And let me tell you that when I was uh, in the midst of all this, I didn't have role models to turn to. Uh, there was, you know, almost no one who had kind of, at least at the Bombay bar that I could, you know, turn to and say that, you know, here is a woman with a family and she seems to have balanced both. There wasn't that kind of thing. And uh, so you always have this dilemma that you've got this lovely child waiting for you at home. And uh, is it worth it really spending all of these hours at work without any briefs? And I've said this before, I, it took me five months after I was back being at work every day and not getting a single new brief for months. So it was very trying. I wondered whether I was doing the right thing. It, it, was, a, it was a huge moral dilemma as well. But for whatever reason, my instinct told me to soldier on. So it is, it is, it is challenging, but I think women can, uh, you know, I, I say this in hindsight, I didn't know better. I just did what came to me. Um, but I think women can, you know, you can cut your coat according to your cloth. There are now, I think women who may want to put, you know, five or six years of practice behind them before they start their families, in which case, you know, they've, 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 they've uh, you know, uh, gathered that much goodwill where, you know, people will come back to them. Um, and, uh, but otherwise, I think it's, it's not, you know, you, you can start out early too, it doesn't matter at the end of the day, but it takes you a long time to realize that. That's um, given me a lot of food for thought, and I'm sure the others as well who are watching and listening to this. So um, yeah, that, that's, that's wonderful actually. That makes you think about all the sort of balancing that needs to be done and also just to have the courage to, as you said, soldier on because sometimes I think that's what sort of bothers people more than anything, just the perception that you need to go back to being that busy that quickly, but not realizing it could take time. And, and your story itself sort of is a great lesson in that sense for us. Um, so my next question is slightly more different, changing gears a little bit. Uh, but you've argued some of the most important cases in India at the Supreme Court, at the various high courts. How do you prepare for arguments? And I know this is sort of like trudging into the trade secrets area, but I would love to know how do you prep? Like how does prep for a case with Madhavi look like? You know, uh, when I moved to the Supreme Court and just to sort of carry forward uh, the first part of our conversation, uh, uh, and I'd like to just uh, get back to that for a minute to say that, look, um, it's not just having children that will interrupt your career. It can also, it can come in different forms. I moved to Delhi because, you know, my, we felt as a family, my husband wanted to move his practice to the Supreme Court. He was designated as 
a, a senior advocate in the Supreme Court. And, you know, as a family, we felt that this is, you know, in, in our overall best interest. And that was, uh, you know, for me professionally, that was, a, you know, a huge uh, change. And I was back to the drawing board all over again. Um, and uh, so I had to unlearn a lot of what I had learned in the Bombay High Court, because it's a very different form of preparation. It is, um, you know, uh, it, it's, it's, it's a very, uh, you know, we, we prepare very differently and in a detailed fashion before the, uh, the, the High Court. Not to say that we don't put in a meticulous effort before the Supreme Court, of course we do, but the focus is very different. It is on that one or you know, two or three points of law and it shouldn't go beyond that. Uh, well, on preparation, I would say that, of course, it depends on the nature of the case. But uh, uh, as you know, in the Supreme Court, there is a huge variety of litigation. Um, it can be on anything. It can be a constitutional issue. It can be a commercial issue. It can be service law. It can be criminal. Um, I mean, a lot of people practice a lot of matrimonial law. So, um, you know, it can be a, a whole range of different subjects. But I would say I, I normally start with getting a really good list of dates in order. And uh, very, you know, frankly, I think people discount the importance of a really good list of dates, but I feel that, you know, uh, and that's something I learned from my senior Janak in the Bombay High Court, and he put in a huge effort, not just a list of dates, but it's really telling your story. So we had notes along with the list of dates. So the list of dates itself stated the facts, and then we had little notes, footnotes, uh, which, which would really, you know, uh, uh, be uh, uh, very useful in arguing the case. And of course, I try and rattle off a note. Uh, as soon as I have, um, you know, conferred with uh, the briefing advocates and uh, right now it's only officers that I usually deal with, but um, so I, I normally uh, uh, rattle off a note after the conference, which sort of at least you know, it, it works as an aid memoir. It is very useful when, you know, if the matter doesn't reach or it doesn't go on for any reason, you come back to it and you know what you were thinking before. And then eventually that forms the basis of written submissions. Uh, so I find that very useful. Um, and then, you know, you can always work and rework it to suit uh, that particular. So I find that that works well. But I'll tell you um, on, on arguing, I, uh, it's funny because I was, um, I, I, I have always um, been a very, very, I was a very diffident debater in um, college. And uh, so much so that I never, I never even went in for, uh, I chickened out of the, um, the, the trials for the debating society. Uh, I wasn't part of the debating society in my college. Uh, so I knew I was going to be very diffident and, uh, uh, and, and then coupled with the fact that, you know, I had a senior like Janak who was like incredibly busy and very often if he was leading me in a case, I wasn't sure whether he was going to be there or not. So I needed to know in my head. So I prepared, you know, one way if I'm assisting him and another way if, you know, if, if I'm left to field on my own. So, you know, you always think of the first few things that are, you know, how you're going to say them. So I, I think that is also important. I think that was a huge uh, 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 grounding, which took place kind of, um, you know, I didn't realize that maybe it was building a little bit of a foundation. And it, I think it has stood me in, in great stead. So much of what you've said right now, I relate to completely, maybe uh, because obviously my senior is taken from his senior, which is the same senior as you. And we start exactly the same way, which is the list of dates. And very often it's the bane of my existence because even when the brief comes at 9 p.m., I'm starting with that list of dates. Uh, but I think that as you said, it's, it's a great starting point and it's a good way to get the facts completely out of hand. And, um, and even the note on argument, something very similar. But I feel exactly the same way when I feel that there is a very strong chance, which is in most cases that my senior might not show up. I, I always prepare that sort of note that this is how I'm going to start and I often find it so funny because I'm like you know I'm actually writing down even your lordship but sometimes that really helps me just sort of start on the on the right track um so thank you for that that was very very useful 
and a great sort of understanding and insight of how you prepare. Um, I think my next question is again sort of changing gears a little bit, but one very tricky area for, for women, um, I think whether at home or whether at chambers or whether you know clerking with a judge, whatever they might be, or even in corporates actually, uh, is casual sexism, the kind that you know you should stand up against, but it's very often in the form of a joke, you know, either from a superior or a colleague or and where a non-passive reaction, anything that just doesn't go along with it, could be considered as extreme or like a bit too much. Uh, so what would your advice to be to women in that situation? Should they stand up? Should they, you know, sort of, how do they handle that? You know, honestly, I think speaking for myself um, and, 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 you know, casual sexism, as you say, rightly, I mean, it often comes in the form of humor. Um, and, and when you, if, if you were to raise a stink about it, it would certainly, you know, women can be perceived, unfortunately, as, you know, being cantankerous or troublemakers or, you know, just shrill, uh, which is really unfortunate. And that is sexist in itself. Um, but as I said, speaking for myself, you know, frankly, uh, it, it surprised me very much that a lot of, um, of my male colleagues also, whom I would have expected, would have seen uh, what was happening there, didn't quite. And they didn't, you know, very often they think it's okay. And I think given that kind of atmosphere, uh, the call that perhaps I took myself was that, you know, just put your head down and work and let your work speak for itself. And that should shut people up, maybe not now, but at some time in the future. Uh, and I don't necessarily say that the, that was the right thing to do. I don't know what the uh, right answers are. They're still very difficult uh, questions. But I do remember that uh, often, you know, in, in, in Merth, um, in these are very senior counsel, you know, they would refer to a particular uh, woman senior advocate who, you know, she would get very upset when something was said either in court or outside. And, uh, you know, she, you know, she would raise a stink about it. Um, and she would often get provoked and they knew she got provoked and they used that against her. So, um, you know, having, having observed all that, uh, I, I mean, this is a call that I took for myself. As I say, I'm, I'm, I'm not saying this is the right way to go about it, but I just felt that sometimes all of this is so distracting. It is um, because it kind of just, it, it's upsetting um, uh, as, as I'm, I'm sure many uh, uh, women advocates um, you know, they experience it or they see someone else experience it on a virtually daily basis. So, um, you know, I, I you know I, I had so many challenges on my hands that I I felt perhaps I don't want to take on yet another challenge and react to everything. Um, so uh, you know my answer was just to put my head down and and work because oftentimes when you're embittered, if you get embittered by the fact that you know your career is maybe not taking off at the same pace as your male colleagues. Um, and, you know, you've got other challenges at home, you're, you know, you're managing a family, all of that. I think, you know, the less battles you feel you have to fight, the better. So um, that's what I did for myself. And, uh, but I think it's, it's, you know, that may not be the correct way, actually, because sometimes when you don't stand up for something, you're perhaps for women to follow, or you're, you're allowing people to get away with it sometimes. And of course, we are only talking about casual remarks, you know, made, uh, 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 and, and those are like, you know, uh, it, it, it's quite rampant, actually. Absolutely, I think um, sort of picking the battles that you are choosing to fight, that, that makes total sense. Um, thank you for that and for your insight into it. My next question is actually sort of more contemporaneous in that sense. Very recently, the United States Supreme Court in the Dobbs v. Jackson case passed a judgment that shocked the US, but also the legal fraternity and many others across the world. Uh, it was the case where, you know, the concept of women's rights slash liberty slash privacy uh, was at loggerheads with religion or, as they said, constitutional ideals. And that has been something that happened even in India 
example, the triple talaq case as well. I want to ask you, what are your thoughts on this and, and these debates, both as a lawyer and as a woman? Well, I think Dobbs is deeply disappointing to put it very mildly in, in many ways. It's not just on the abortion issue per se, but it's just, you know, um, the constitutional vision is so, is so blinkered. I mean, you know, a constitution always looks forward. The court always takes a constitutional, you know, uh, 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 interpretation in a progressive direction. This is deeply regressive. And I'd say not just on the abortion issue. It's, it's about this whole um, originalist interpretation of the constitution of um, looking for the original text. Um, and, uh, uh, I, and I think this portends very, very dangerous, um, you know, for the future, because uh, um, I find it a contradiction in terms for the Supreme Court of the United States to have said that on the, we, 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 this is only for, uh, uh, this is only for abortion, we're not touching other rights, but at the same time, I mean, the same theory applies for other rights too. They were not part of the original text. They couldn't have been part of the original text because you know the, 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 the society moves with the times and there are new challenges with, which emerge with uh, uh, moving times. So I think for that reason, it's, it's deeply regressive. And also, of course, of course, from a, a, a woman's autonomy standpoint, it is a, a, a very, very regressive. Um, having said that, I mean, I would say that this is also a wake up call uh, uh, in India, because I think we need to, of course, you know, their re reproductive rights, autonomy for women, and it has a lot to do with their, you know, how they're going to perform in, in, in other arenas as well in their careers, etc. But it's also important, I think, to have some, you know, I think greater awareness um, on reproductive rights, on reproductive you know, on, on, on what the human body can do, because, you know, in, in our schools, we are, it's so, it's still so taboo, the subject of sex education for both, uh, for both men and women. So I think uh, it's, it's very, very important to have a greater awareness on all, all of this. Um, uh, because, you know, an abortion is also not an easy thing to undergo for a woman. So therefore, I think awareness, education, much more actively is the answer. I mean, I was recently uh, traveling and in, in, in Latin America, one of the, you know, we were, uh, uh, it, it's a huge problem. Single teenage mothers who are not able to, you know, they're not even able to care for themselves. And, uh, uh, you know, they, they, they do not have the financial means to uh, sustain themselves and they're saddled with these babies. So, you know, the whole idea, you know, which really I think is very worrisome to have children growing up without families or not in the atmosphere of a family. Of course, the notion of a family is undergoing a change, but it's also important, whatever that family be, you do need a family to, to grow up with. So I think for that reason, I mean, you mentioned triple talaq. Uh, well, uh, the, the truth is that, you know, even in the triple talaq case, uh, we almost lost by a whisker, you know, because it's a, it was a three to two, a very narrow majority. So, you know, even with a practice as egregious, as instant, we were only, we were only talking about instantaneous to put the laugh, that, you know, it just could have passed muster. Uh, so I think, you know, that was also, I, I found it, I mean, I've written about this, but um, it, 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 it was a huge lesson. You know, I thought it's a given. It should be a given in any society, but it, it, it wasn't so easy. It wasn't quite so easy. Absolutely. Um, thank you. That, that was very interesting to hear because I think it's something that just happened and a lot of women have been affected by it and are bothered about it. And I think, it, as you said, it's, it's a much sort of bigger scheme of what's to come, maybe sort of an alarm bell in that sense. So my next question, and I, and I think I'll keep, this is my last question because, um, I know we're short on time, uh, but what, according to you, are the key differences in advocacy at the high court and Supreme Court level? And I think you are sort of best place to answer that. And uh, I think everyone would love to hear sort of how you tackle that and what you think the key differences actually are. 
Well, I think uh, it, it's, it's a very different uh, uh, skill set that is required in the Supreme Court. Uh, and as I said, you need to unlearn a lot of what you learned at the High Court. Having said that, I think a lot of the a lot of what I did learn in the High Court uh, at a certain level became very useful. Certain skills I acquired in a you know in a, in a solid commercial court like uh, Bombay uh, uh, also helped. But of course, you had to sort of repackage that completely. Well, two days of the week in the Supreme Court, as you know, are miscellaneous days, so it's all very hit and miss. You have very little time to make your point, so you can't be making very copious notes that you're not going to be able to. Um, you know, uh, 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 and you know, naturally the bench is in a hurry because they've got to get through you know a list of perhaps sixty cases. So uh, I think you've got to pick those one or two points and be able to you know deliver them effectively. Um, but uh, uh, of course, on final hearing days, it's a, it's a different thing. But it's different because also you know the case is kind of packaged. Uh, uh, you know, in the sense that you've, you've gone through those many layers of, and this is the final court. Uh, the, being the final court is also, you know, additional stress because you know there's nowhere to go from here. So I think to that extent, it's a little more stressful, the practice, uh, because you know what you're carrying on your shoulders. Um, but um, I, 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 I've actually really enjoyed, I have to say, the, the variety of work. Uh, it, I thought we had a fair variety in Bombay, but I think the Supreme Court is quite phenomenal that way. It just can be, you know, as I said, in a given day, you could have done environment law, service law, constitutional uh, law, commercial, it could be anything. That's very interesting. I think we, uh, do you mind if I ask your last question? I think this one I was very excited about. So if you have the time, I can ask you. Sure, sure, go ahead. Go ahead. Um, so this question I was actually very excited about as someone who personally admires your career journey so much and aspires to have a career like yours. Um, but I wanted to ask, this is very broad ended, but I would love for you to share your thoughts on your highlights and sort of key learnings from your journey and any advice for women lawyers along the way. I, I, I'm, I'm still, I don't think I'm very equipped to give advice, but I can certainly you know, in, in hindsight, I feel that for a woman who, particularly a woman who aspired for a family, I think tenacity was the key. Uh, I mean, speaking for myself, just hanging in there, just hanging in there is half the battle one, because I think women generally tend to kind of, you know, fall off the ladder because they're not able to uh, juggle family and work, or, or, you know, uh, a spouse's uh, transfer to some other city, uh, you know, takes them away or whatever. Um, but I think tenacity, if you have that, that discipline and that determination to stick it out, I think uh, in the later years, it's, it's, it becomes, you know, you, you tend to stand out uh, a, a little more because, as I said, you know, so many others have just kind of just faded away, unfortunately. Uh, so, and, and it's interesting that, you know, in, in the first, I've said this before, but in the first, say, 20 years of my practice, I would say that, you know, gender in some form or the other was, was you know, it felt like a hurdle, you know, at, at, in, in so many ways. But I think after that, and I've been around now about 27 years, um, it's suddenly it's it's a it's it's looked upon as an asset because you know there are fewer women um, at at that you know at the senior advocate level there are not many as you know and uh, you know diversity has suddenly become the great buzzword but uh, of course they don't know what it takes to just hang in there um, but so I'd say tenacity is one thing. The second thing I'd, I'd say that, you know, when you look at women at that level, oftentimes you find that uh, women are single, you know, uh, which is, of course, if, if that's a choice that women make, that's wonderful. But, you know, the perception in the, in, in that, that people carry away is that, oh, a career woman cannot have a family. And I don't think that if the, if the choice they make to be single, to not have a family, that's, that's absolute, that's wonderful. 
but if if they do want to have a family i don't think that they should have to make that choice because men don't make that choice of course it requires sort of you know it requires a lot of planning it requires far more efficiency and you know frankly all of these things are as important as knowing the law and knowing how to tackle your brief because uh, you know it, it's ultimately how efficiently you manage your life that's going to really play out in your career as well and i remember that uh, and maybe i should share this that i've worked sometimes you know on, on on given cases with some of the uh some absolutely uh, uh very inspirational lawyers uh, some of whom are no more now uh but um and when when i i remember observing that these are men who of course they were like magic in court but they had lives outside the court as well they you know loved the literature and music and uh travel and and so many different uh, uh interests that they pursued and this sort of almost magically became possible because they had spouses who were just you know magical at home because they seemed to manage the family the upbringing of the children all of that they just and they you know they were but but at the end of the day you know the uh, the life of a very successful counsel is so exacting that the spouse ends up being a facilitator often times and that was at least so in the generations that preceded us now we have different kinds of challenges we haven't seen you know uh, uh, if you have you know a couple with you know it, it's important i think it's important for people's fulfillment and to you know feel like you're not just i mean i i think it's very important that i would not ever discount the role of a homemaker at all i think it's a very very admirable role and if women choose to do that that that's wonderful but i think that you know at least i would not have been satisfied with 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 playing that kind of role and uh, it, it's going to be so much more challenging now so therefore it needs it's it, it's not impossible um it, it needs some planning it needs it needs much better management of time and that's that's something that you know i think they should be teaching at law school for both men and women because it's important to have men as a part of this conversation absolutely i think what you said about men being a part of this conversation really hits home because very often it's just for the most basic things they are credited for and that is the most basic that they can do but that is the way it's functioning but as you said there's hope for a better tomorrow because i think as generations are going by that sort of equality in partnership and and in everything that relates even to the house is is starting to come about so i think that last question was was great and i'm so glad that i could actually ask you that because i think and also i i add one thing there that you know i think it's important for women to remember that, you know being a woman is a many splendid thing and there's you know there is there's so much i have enjoyed doing you know with uh, uh, uh you know quite even i've enjoyed my children i have uh, you know i've been able to pursue my interests other interests other than the law um and uh, i think it's it's a council practice in some ways has given me that flexibility uh because you know we have generous vacations it gives you time to catch up with other things and so um while it has its downsides i think it also has great advantages and i think women should just grab all of that absolutely um and i think everything you said is a lot of food for thought and especially the point on being tenacious i think that's a reminder to all of us sort of on an everyday level that that's what you got to do at the end of the day to sort of see and it is a long journey but it is a marathon and not a sprint so i think as long as we sort of understand that it it makes things a lot easier but i just want to take this moment to really really thank you from the bottom of my heart and for all the women i'm sure who are going to enjoy this so much and enjoy this conversation take away a lot from it and of course from the entire whole forum team as well so thank you so much for being with us madhvi and and for being so patient and for answering all of these questions and having and taking the time to have this conversation thank you so much thank you very much thank you that was fun